Do you have a poverty squat? Is it living in a Howard Johnson using government vouchers? Is it cooking hot dogs over a tire fire in a food for less parking lot? Well, fret not, because I'm here to help you pick yourself up by your bootstraps and start enjoying the high life. Gee, that was a really strained metaphor. And we're moving on with the week of tier lists. And today we are attacking the barbell back squat. These are going to be the most prescribed squat variations. These are the ones you see the most often. They're the most relatable. And you want to pay attention because each one could be the difference between breaking through that next plateau or just wasting hours of time and effort. So let's get into it. All right, so first up is narrow stance squatting. I'm going to focus on foot placement, not bar height. Usually people say high bar, low bar for kind of shorthand of these uh, different squat styles. But you can change the bar position without doing a lot to change how the glutes, quads, hamstrings are actually working. But if you change the foot position, it's guaranteed. So narrow stance, it's usually synonymous with like an Olympic squat where you're very upright, you have a high bar placement. And because you're staying upright, you turn it into more of a standing leg press. So there's a lot more knee flexion. So it's much better for developing the quads. Uh, it's kind of like a close grip for your squat. And that extra range means it's a really good developmental option for your, your uh, glutes and your quads. And a lot of power lifters include high bar work or narrow stance work where they're staying more upright because it really increases knee extension and that leads to squat PRs like 100% of the time. The only thing with this movement is that it may not carry over to your squat if we're talking about what's going to boost your squat up for 100% of lifters. There's people with certain builds who are a little bit limited. They don't have the mobility, the comfort, and if there's just this huge gap between your high bar and your low bar or your narrow and wide squat because it's awkward for you, not necessarily because you're weak, then it may not provide the benefit that you're looking for. I think most people should take time to learn how to squat with a higher bar and with a more narrow stance and a more upright position. I think it's a more athletic developmental movement, but for the purposes of developing your back squat, we have to rank it down just because it doesn't quite apply. It doesn't really target the weak areas for 100% of the people. So we are still going to give the narrow stance, the more high bar Olympic stance squat, A tier status. It's a fantastic developer. If you have a choice, I think it's the way that most should learn how to squat because there's just more benefit to it. And of all the things I've criticized Louis Simmons for, one of the things that I kind of agree with is that squatting wider, is going to be applicable to more things. Whereas if you have a really, really good narrow squat, especially if you're used to dive bombing and staying very upright, going wider, going more controlled might be a little more difficult for you. So I tend to think that narrow stance goes wide and not quite as much the other way around. So we rank it down just a bit. Moving on to the next one, wide stance squats. Wide stance squats are synonymous with low bar. You're going to be more bent over, there's more hip hinging, and that means it's fantastic for the glutes and the hamstrings. It really teaches that hip extension, and because of that, it carries over to the deadlift more. So if you don't have a very wide stance, if you're kind of medium or medium wide, I recommend throwing in some wider stance squats, it's a great way. You'll feel the stretch in your adductors. You'll feel like you're kind of squatting into your adductors and your hamstrings as you're pushing your knees out. So it's a great way to feel that tension. Uh, it's a great way to practice control because you're not going to be rebounding uh, your wide stance squats. At least if you want your groin to stay attached, you're not going to do that. So it, it, pra it teaches control. So it's a really great movement for that. Um, the controlled descent is a huge, huge one. A lot of these guys that squat this way, they're like human forklifts. And it's also a lot more versatile than a high bar. Uh, the involvement of the posterior chain, I think, makes it carry over to more things. In addition to being kind of like the default powerlifting style of squatting because the range is lower and theoretically you could squat more. But because of the number of problems it solves, who it's likely to help, the different things it carries over to, and the fact that it carries over directly to the squat, I got to give wide stance squats. Here we got Kroklazeski with that powerlifter ultra wide squat. I got to give it S tier status. It's just a fantastic way to approach the squat. It does a lot of things well. I'm not necessarily talking about stupid like west side wide, but going a bit wider than you are typically comfortable getting out of that comfort zone, that's going to do a lot. I got to give a quick shout out to Boost Camp. I have my programs up there, Full Sturker, Kong, Bull Mastiff, and there are many more free programs. It's absolutely free to use. Easy way to log your workouts on your phone. You can look at how different programs are put together. You can make comparisons. You can run them in real time. Super convenient. So go ahead and check out Boost Camp if you haven't. Next, we're going into the front squat. Upper back and core heavy. I love front squats because what they do for strongman, anything where you're like extending through your knees and hips, like 
out in front of you, uh, or if you're having to support weight in front of you, front squats are great. And that can fix a problem for a lot of people. And it's one of the reasons I recommend it for almost everybody when they're in that new kind of early intermediate phase, because it is such a good developmental exercise. It's like all the stuff that a high bar narrow stance squat does, but more because you physically can't bend over. So it keeps you honest that way. It is limited a bit by technique and some builds, some body types might find more struggle than it's worth. So like I said about the narrow stance squatting, if it's just so hopelessly awkward, if you're like all femurs, if there's no iteration of, of technique you can employ that's going to make it comfortable so you can actually handle some weight, you might be better off looking to something like a harness or like a safety bar to kind of mimic that. I'm going to give it B tier. It is amazing for developing the quads provided you can get into a reasonably good position. Most of you guys aren't limited by your build. You're limited by the fact that it's fucking uncomfortable. You don't want to do it. Um, but if you can get away with it, it's worth practicing. It's going to help set you up, not just as a lifter, as a squatter, but as an overall strength athlete, which I think is very important. It's just somewhat limited. I think it's a bit limited, especially for more advanced guys in how directly it's going to help their squat because load is so much more reduced and the movement pattern is different enough. Huge fan of front squats. They got to go B tier though. I got to rank them down just a little bit. Remember what I'm ranking this stuff in this like linear fashion. This isn't the be all end all. If something solves a particular problem, then it's S tier. If like front squats fix a problem you have, then it's S tier. But as far as a universal movement that you can just bank on overhauling your squat and setting a new squat PR, it's limited. So things get ranked down when they have more specific use cases as opposed to being applicable to a greater number of people. So now we're going into Zercher squats. This is in line with the uh, odd lifting kick I've been on lately. Uh, I actually do like Zercher squats. There's some strong men that have done them pretty regularly. You can look at Kiriakos doing his silly shit. You can look at uh, Nick Best used them quite a bit. And he was amazing at things where the weight's in front of you. Things like uh, uh, Hussafel stone carries. Sorry, Hussafel stone carries. I got uh, called out in the comments for pronouncing that wrong. But uh, one of the best in the world at that, just really good at walking with the weight in front of him. Um, Zercher squats, great on the back and abs. If you've never done them before, a set of Zercher squats with any amount of weight, your abs are gonna be sore for days. It's an entirely different thing. And because the weight is lower, it's more of a hip movement. Anything that puts the, the load closer to your hips is going to utilize your hips more. And uh, that is going to hammer your glutes. So that hip extension, again, strongman, everything's extending through the hips with the weight in front of you. And it's also kind of fun and kind of novel. I think Zercher squats are a very good developmental movement. And I think they can absolutely help you get stronger, especially if you have to prepare for some other shit that isn't just a barbell back squat. However, the movement pattern is very different. It's a very non-specific movement pattern. It can be uncomfortable, pain tolerant, especially with holding the bar and the elbows can be a limiting factor. So it's not going to carry over mechanically to your squat. I wouldn't put this movement as one that's guaranteed to boost your squat up. I think it's a good developmental exercise overall, just not quite as targeted towards getting your back squat five or 10% higher. So I'm going to give it C tier. Extremely useful movement. I'm not hating on Zerchers. I do think they're very valuable, especially coming as a, uh, coming as a strong man. Um, it's useful, but big squat numbers will give you a big Zercher, not the other way around. Next up is a camber bar. Camber bar is really cool and I actually use it a lot when I have access to it because the weight can swing back, the weight hangs low and off to the side and it can swing back and you can scoop your hips into it and that gives you a direct leverage advantage. Um, and by doing that, it teaches the, the hips to come through quickly, which I really like because a, a lot of the times that people get stuck in a deadlift or a squat and you'll hear people yelling, hips, hips. What they mean is that focus on getting your hips underneath you as opposed to just going up, 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 and it immediately puts you into a stronger position. So it's a good, helpful cue. Um, it might be easier to recover from too uh, because the, the fact of the weight being back, it's less load on your spine and the muscles around your torso. So I've known coaches that have used this as a way to get squat work in while not having the beat down systemically that barbell back squats carry. It's comfortable on the shoulders because you're grabbing off to the sides. So you really big, fat, bound guys that have to get in real tight. You get the bicep tendonitis. It can help with that. I do really like camber bars for the specific things that they do well that I have use for. But if you don't have a handle on those things, I do think this is a movement that's going to it's going to be a little bit of a waste for newer lifters. If you're still in that basic developmental phase, you see the movement pattern down, you need some muscle. So I wouldn't necessarily put camber bar squats as, as the great muscle builder, the great developmental tool, even though it obviously will develop you, any type of squat will. 
I really recommend this for like affecting your recovery and your workouts. And I recommend it for particular cues that you're trying to drill. But as a developer, I don't rank it super high. I don't know anybody that started doing cambered bar squats. And then all of a sudden their, uh, their squat went through the roof. It's like the way a West side lifter, a conjugate lifter would use camber. It's variation for the sake of it. It's a different hit to your nervous system. It's not so much that it, targets a particular weakness or has some special developmental feature that's going to pump you up. So I do like camber bars though. I use them quite a bit. I would just take them with a grain of salt. I'm going to give these C status. Again, that looks bad. You see C status, you think it's worthless. It's absolutely not. It's just for the purposes of overhauling your squat specifically. I don't think it's that great unless it addresses a particular problem with you and you need to be aware of what that problem is before you put them in. Up next is safety squat bar. Now this is a really popular one that most people go to, not because it does so much for their squat, but because it's comfortable. Again, the big bound fat guys like having the handles in front, it's easier on the shoulders. I know I've had shoulder and bicep tendon issues that, that made that a lot more comfortable. Um, the, the, the bend in the bar shifts the weight in front and that it's basically an intermediate between a back squat and a front squat. By placing the weight forward, that's why you feel it in your upper back. That's why you feel like you want to stay more upright because that's the easiest way to deal with that stress. So on the one hand, it can force you to stay more upright and be a good quad developer by tricking you into basically doing a high bar narrow stance squat. Or if you fight against it, you can just double down and say, nope, I'm gonna squat how I squat and the muscles that are weak just need to grow. And that's how your upper back, your midsection is gonna get strong so you can really push your back into that weight as you come up. Uh, most people use it honestly just because it's comfy on the neck and accommodates the tight shoulders, I think more so than because they're trying to drill those specific weaknesses. Uh, for getting the upper back stronger, I think is great. For improving your squat, kind of like camber bar, it's more individual. It's really gonna hinge on if it fixes a weak point for you or not. And if you take it seriously for what it's intended to do. Uh, squatters with a strong back or who are already uh, very comfy in an upright position, probably not going to get much more doing that. I'm going to put this also as C tier. It is a very worthy movement to have in your rotation. Uh, and if it addresses that problem, it's gold. However, a lot of people, especially the ones coming up, aren't going to have that problem. So I recommend a lot less work with specialty bars. And that's kind of the pattern of how I'm ranking this with new lifters, uh, with people that still have miles to go. If you haven't squatted 500 pounds, uh, if you don't have you know noticeably big legs, you've got work to do and it's not gonna come from dicking around with these specialty bars. Going into the Bulgarian split squat. I'm a big fan of unilateral work. There were a bunch of other exercises I put on here that I had to kind of cut back because we just didn't have time. Uh, Bulgarian split, uh, split squats I put up because I think they're one of the best you can do. I do like lunges, I do like step ups. Bulgarian split squats are unique in that it's still kind of a two leg movement because you can use your back leg a bit more, um, but it very much puts that weight on the front of your leg. It can help shore up weaknesses. It can uh, keep you well-rounded, keep your mobility a bit higher. I like that there is a little bit of a balance component to it and that it requires you to be more than just strong in that direction. So I do like Bulgarian split squats and they suck. Oh my God, the pain tolerance when you get into the reps. Uh, Scott Brengel, who uh, used to coach me when I first got started into strongman, would have us do this challenge where we would do a hold at the bottom of a Bulgarian split squat for five minutes on each leg. And it was really just a matter of pain tolerance. And it was it's useful. It's useful to take it to, to those extremes. He had a rationale that there actually was some mechanism being triggered that did help with growth and was useful for athletics. I haven't looked into it beyond that, but that's something I'm probably going to revisit soon. Um, the only drawbacks, because it's unstable, it's harder to load to get those really big loads. Uh, might be worth look, uh, looking into doing it in like a Smith machine if you wanna get heavy. Because I have to imagine getting heavy has a ton of value with this movement huge developmental stress on the glutes and quads. Like this is probably one of the movements I like that has the load reduced that I still think is such a good developmental movement. It's likely to have a positive impact on your, uh, on your legs. So I'm going to give this one B tier. I'm going to rank it slightly above the specialty uh, bars because I think it addresses more problems for the person who's likely to be watching this. Uh, then the specialty bars do. Good unilateral work is important long-term to stay healthy. Uh, it, usually people don't drill it as hard. So if you're watching this, you're probably not doing the unilateral work as hard or as seriously as you could. And doing this for you know six or eight weeks 
could help thicken your legs out and increase your leg drive a little bit, make you a more efficient squatter. So I'm a big fan of Bulgarian split squats. It's just they're not going to be like the super targeted method to really hitting that next PR. I probably wouldn't put them in six or eight weeks out from a meet. Next up is box squats, and I've talked about these before. Uh, I used to avoid box squats, not take them seriously. I, when I was younger anyways, I associated it very much with West Side style training. And my first introduction to them was when I used them because I had a back injury, and it was the first movement I could do uh, that didn't hurt my back. I couldn't squat to parallel with a bar in a free weight squat. I couldn't squat to parallel in a free squat. I couldn't deadlift. My back would just light up. So loading up, the weight on a box squat, squatting just like an inch or two above parallel with a little wider than I was used to, didn't hurt. In fact, I felt a lot better and I knew that was my end to recovery. Whenever you're injured, you don't wanna stop. You just wanna find things you can do to keep the ball rolling. And then you, you maneuver as you feel better, as you build confidence. You don't have to be in a rush, just move at your own pace, but move, that's the most important thing. Thing is for box squats, less direct carry of it's less specific to dive bombers. So if you have an Olympic squat, if you're the Pat Mendez style squatter that can just slam the piss out of 800 pound squats and you use the rebound to carry that through and stand up, this isn't going to have quite as much direct carryover. That doesn't mean it's not going to help. I do like movements like this generally because it does teach you control and it teaches you breaking from a dead stop. So there's very much a benefit to that and if you never train that way that actually might be the thing that helps you out but that's going to be pretty individual uh, box squats are best done uh, with no rocking or bouncing a lot of people ruin them by going too high uh, by ro rocking back sitting way back and then running forward and standing up you want to sit down relax your hip flexors and then fire through i like to pick my heels up and then slam through the ground because that tells me i released all my weight stretch reflex is completely gone i'm going from a dead stop as you notice your ability to leap off the box increase you're going to notice just about everything else increase and it's it's pretty universal i don't know anybody that's gotten their box squat to a reasonable depth uh improved but to reasonable depth i mean no no more than an inch above parallel many of you should be squatting to your normal depth. Uh, but I don't know anybody that's seen an improvement there and hasn't seen their regular squat improve. Uh, it's also versatile. You can use different heights, different stances, different bars to solve problems. That also works against it because people who are left to their own devices can engage in a bunch of fuckery and just bastardize it to where it's just, it's just a, a shit show of, hey, look at me, look at these weird different novel things I'm doing. You want it to address a specific problem, but a standard box squat, I'm a big fan of. I think it fixes way more problems than it has potential uh, pitfalls. I think it's versatile. I think it applies to a bunch of people. Um, great for building starting speed, carries over to deadlifting. Um, most specific patterning carryovers probably to wider squatters but I think everybody should have this in their rotation at some point um, because you can never have a start that is too strong. So I'm going to put box squats at A tier. I'm, I'm a big fan of them. Next up is pause squats. Pause squats take away stretch reflex, just like the box squats do if you're doing them right, which is hugely relied upon in squatting. We rely on loading down and then coming back up. And especially in powerlifting, it's different than deadlifts because deadlifts are done from a dead stop. And it's different than benching because they make you pause. So we rely on the bounce over and over and over. Well, stopping that going from a dead stop can probably do more for, for your squat, for most of the people watching this, than just about anything else. It's probably the single biggest thing anyone can do to augment their squat right now in the short term. Uh, it's very, very sport specific. It's very neurologically specific. So it trains strength specific qualities. How many motor units can you recruit right now? How fast can you recruit them? Probably not as great for hypertrophy because for hypertrophy, you wanna look more towards uh, the type of fatigue that comes from moving continuously through a wider range of motion. This puts all the emphasis on the start, on that one, that one immediate hit. I'm going to put pause squats as an S tier movement. I am a huge fan of pause squats. I put them in just about every program. Uh, I have put them developmentally, like pause squats to start for like five to eight reps, followed by your regular hypertrophy fuckery. That is a good way to go about it. And then, and then as we get more specific, we're just going pause squat right before the meet with heavier loads. And it just conditions a nasty start. Huge fan of pause squats. Up next, we're going to accommodating resistance. I mean, if you watched any of the other tier lists, you can probably guess how this is gonna go. Uh, I actually like it less for squatting than I do for benching, and I didn't rank it very high for the bench. The reason being is that as you get, the, what bands are supposed to do and what chains are supposed to do, as you get higher and higher and higher, you are in a mechanically stronger position. The more extended the joint is, 
the stronger you are. So you're in a mechanically stronger position. So you're always limited by either your stick point or by your weakest, most disadvantaged position, which is usually towards the bottom. So the idea is if you can make it heavier as you go up, then every inch of movement is going to represent a more thorough amount of stress. So it's not like, well, I'm working hard off the bottom, but the lockout's kind of easy. It's just hard the whole way. So it makes sense and it fixes a problem of coasting. So I'm not saying it doesn't have value. Uh, the reason you coast in a squat is because you are so much more mechanically strong at the top. Nobody misses a squat, you know, three inches from lockout unless they lost their balance. So the coasting is you get past the stick point, you just, it's like jogging. You just hit the gas enough to complete the lift, but you don't wanna show off here. You don't wanna push you hard. You don't wanna gas yourself out. Well, if you don't coast, if you just push as hard as you can the whole way through, that's compensatory acceleration. That conditions uh, more motor units being recruited at once. That conditions you recruiting those motor units faster. That's how you build strength. That's how you build explosiveness. So it is a vital tool to have. Bands and chains are one way of teaching that. And the reason I like it less for squatting than benching is because squatting, you're really strong at the top. Benching, a lot of people are deficient at lockout. It's not that way for squatting. So it has less of a, a use case in my opinion. It's also a clusterfuck to set up. Most people, and again, the people watching this, I know I'm not likely to set up bands and chains correctly, and I've been doing this for a while. Most of the people watching this, it, it's sexy to spend 20, 30 minutes setting it up the first time you do it, but it's not warranted, it's not necessary. Given the complexity, you don't have as much to gain out of it. Again, most of you need more development, more broad muscular growth, more comfort with a regular squat, and then you utilize advanced movements like this as you experiment with more complex structures, as you get stronger, not just because you're bored right now. And then you start to get a handle on what they're supposed to do in the right context. And that's how you get the best use out of it. I also think it does have athletic utility. I think speed work is great for people that need to be fast. I just contend that squatting, deadlifting, benching, to have good lifts, to be strong in those capacities, it's not so speed specific as a lot of people have made it out to be. So all the bands, all the chains, I'm gonna give this, this is our first D tier squat movement. I think it's a lot more trouble than it's worth. I think the time setting up and trying to calculate uh, percentages of, of tension at the top is taking away from good developmental work you can be doing. And even though you're gonna do it, because I know a lot of you are gonna see this, you're gonna be like, let me see what this is about. You're gonna do it and be like, oh, I did squats with bands, my ass was really sore. And it's gonna be like a big epiphany. I'm telling you that once you get over that first initial hump of the novelty, it's gonna be harder and harder to get that transfer to your squat that you're looking for. Next, we're going to a pin squat, specifically from the bottom, just uh, how I described pin bench presses in my bench press tier list, Go out, crawling underneath it, going from the bottom, not having the benefit of loading into it first and then changing direction. Even when you do something like a pause squat, the fact that you can load into it first, it triggers the, the movement pattern so that your coordination and changing direction and putting force in the right direction it's greatly improved when you do that. If you're going from a dead stop, you're gonna feel like you don't know which direction to push. Like in a pin bench, you go to push and it skips forward. You realize that you weren't actually pushing up. So I actually think that's valuable in getting you to get a handle on exactly what direction uh, the weight goes up from a dead stop. And it's also very, very hard. Same neurological development you get from pause squats and uh, box squats if you do them right. Uh, so really, really helpful that way. Yeah, these will destroy your glutes the first time you do them. I mean, these will really, really hammer your glutes because they aren't used to moving you out of the hole without the benefit of that trampoline effect that they use. Different stimulus on the muscle. So good developmental quality uh, for many of you that try it out. Uh, also, it's stimulus with less weight. So I like it for that because when you start out, you're not gonna be using a ton of weight. As you see that gap close, that means that your confidence at the bottom, that means your handle of, of how the squat starts is going to be so much better. And that's gonna carry over directly to your squat. It is a highly neurologically focused uh, stimulus, which means it's going to carry over directly to strength, to your top end weights that you're going to be using. I'm gonna put bottom up squats. This is a hidden gem, guys. This is the one that, that a lot of you guys aren't doing regularly. I would probably put this uh, more in a strength phase than in an early developmental phase, but I would take some time to get comfortable with this. I think this has the potential to be an S tier exercise for many of you. I really like things that challenge the start, that get you, that get you just fighting to get the bar going and takes away all of the advantages you normally get in a free weight squat. The big fan of anything that does that for your squat. Last up, we have belt squats. 
This is the closest we're getting to machines. I thought about putting like leg presses and hack squats and whatever in here, but it just, it went off the rails. There's too many things that work your legs that we could put here. Bell squats are specific to squatting because it's the same pattern. So I think of it as like a, a hybrid between a squat and a leg press, which is nice. It focuses on the legs, which is missing from a lot of powerlifting style squat programs because the movement becomes this entire entity that you're training. You're not just training your legs. You're training the movement, your upper back, your midsection, your hips, what everything is doing, how it's recovered matters greatly. So by taking the torso out of it, it's allowing the legs to be hammered, to increase your ability to actually push with the legs. So it's more specific than a leg press and it carries over directly to your squat. Wide variety of ranges that can be hit here. Phenomenal for hypertrophy. Hypertrophy is always going to be part of the squat equation. Hypertrophy work and neurologically specific work. Those are the two things you wanna hit if you want a big squat. This really, really covers uh, both of those actually. You can pull through a lot of reps. You can do crazy drop sets. You can do advanced fatigue techniques. You can really punish yourself with these, but you can also go heavy. You really load up the belt squat. You can do things like pauses. You can play with your stance. You can really increase the ability of your legs to just push by hyper fixating on them. So I really like it for that. If any of you were to regularly put in belt squats at the end of your work without sacrificing any of the earlier work, like if you just added it in, I guarantee in six or eight weeks time, you will be squatting more than you squat now. I, that's pretty much a universal statement. And everybody should periodically revisit dedicated hypertrophy phases. This is the type of work you wanna lean on for that. So belt squats, S tier all the way. So that is my squat tier list. Let me know what you guys think. Leave it in the comments. Thank you so much for watching guys. I plan on doing a lot more of these. You guys seem to like it. I like making them easy way for me to just ramble on about the things that I know, and it seems to be a lot more digestible. So leave your recommendations for uh, what types of tier lists you wanna see from me. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, this is Bromley, I'll see you.